Hey guys, and welcome to this episode of Metacast. Uh, our guest for this episode is the supremely funny uh, Darren Frost. He played uh, Sloan on Metabots. How are you going? I'm good. I'm good. This is a this technology is very interesting. I don't think I've ever talked to anyone in real time in New Zealand ever. So this is uh, this is great. Yeah, a lot of people don't even know we exist. Just tucked away in the corner of the world there. Oh, I I know you exist. I've I've toured with many comedians that make sure I know there's a difference between New Zealand and Australia and all the other places. I'm very well aware. <laughs> um. We have you on the show today to uh, to talk about your role in Metabots. So I guess, uh, how did that uh, come about? Because it was sort of at the beginning of your voice acting uh, career there. Yeah, so I'm, uh, by, by most accounts, I'm a stand-up comic. And being a stand-up comic lends itself to certain things. And I started out doing a lot of commercial work because in commercials and anywhere in the world, you have, you have to be funny in a very short period of time. And stand-up comedy teaches you to do that very quickly. So I started doing a bunch of commercials. I went in to do a voiceover class and uh, the teacher, a great teacher, still a casting director to this day, she heard my voice. I was supposed to be reading for a sexy like jeans commercial. She stopped me halfway through. And she said, you know what, Darren, you're never going to be the sexy Levi's guy. This is what you're probably going to do. And she handed me a bunch of animated scripts. And literally two weeks later, I started auditioning for cartoons and I booked a couple and probably the third or fourth one I booked was Metabots. And it's my first uh, Japanimation or anime that I ever did. And I've done a fair amount since then, but it was the first one. And it was a bit of a learning curve and it's not an easy thing to do, even though you may think it is because it's been done before. And actually, anime is twice as hard as a regular cartoon to do. Yeah, it seems like, uh, I guess, transitioning, you say, you know, the skills are pretty one-to-one, -one, but uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, dubbing over the lines you see, were you just sort of dumped in at the deep end or were you given much coaching? Uh, you know what? Uh, in the world of anime, especially back then, it's like, what can we get done very fast and pump out the lines? Um, so, you know, in the beginning, it was a learning curve for me because I was about, oh, it's about character, it's about this. But then after a while, once you've got the voice down and you can really pump out the lines, that's what it's more about. It's just about a, 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 how much can you get done because it's not an easy thing. And that's why a lot of people don't stick with it. I mean, I've, I took a break for a while because I was almost blowing my voice out because in a lot of anime, not so much Metabots, but other things I did, it was a lot of yelling. Mm. And you can be yelling for like two hours and it just blows your voice out. So Metabots wasn't like that for me. Thankfully, I wasn't that character in it. But, you know, I've had other examples of like Bakugan or other shows, uh, Beyblade, that it's just a lot of screaming and it can blow your voice out. Yeah, you um, you have your characters on Bakugan as well. And I think comparing uh, them and your Metabots character, they're both sort of this uh, tough guy, bully kind of character. Yes, yes. Uh, is that a role you like playing? It's not a role I like playing. It's my voice. Hmm. And you know what? You got to play to what you are, like vocally. And I know there's my... Th you've interviewed Rob Tinkler. Rob Tinkler is so amazing. And the thing about Rob Tinkler is he's got a net that's so wide in the number of voices he can do. I generally can do three or four voices. I can do the bully, the nerd, or the kind of nervous, schleppish guy. Hmm. And luckily, those three characters reoccur in so many cartoons that I'm able to have my little island and that's the roles I do and that's kind of you know that's what I do so um it was pretty easy doing the bully voice I've been bullied all my life my stand-up comedy is based on being bullied my life has been that so it was a pretty easy thing for me to flip on and off uh with Metabots do you remember any I guess uh, scene or line that you had sort of particular fun with or was out of the ordinary the main thing i remember about sloan is that kind of <laughs> that laugh that was his kind of signature thing for me in my memory um but other things that i do remember about metabots are two or three things one I, it was the first time i had to do an accent because they gave me another role and i had to play some french guy and i don't do accents my agent knows i don't do accents i never say i do accents and here i am knee deep doing accents and they're like you're not really doing a good job of this darren i'm like yeah i'm not the greatest guy to do a french thing so i really remember that i'm being oh i gotta get this done uh, you know do a french guy darren do your best job 
Uh, my other real big memory for it is about eight years ago, I did my first fan expo and I put together a poster of all my voices on one poster and I had like nine slots and I have like in North America, I'm known for five or six really big kind of character things. And I had two or three slots open and I have about, uh, you know, 15 or 20 other voices I could have put in there. And I just put in Metabots because I'm like, it's a role I liked. It was a lot of episodes. And I'll tell you, over that three days, more people came up to me than any other character once they saw that poster. They're like, oh, man, Metabots. And to me, I didn't know it was that big until that weekend because I was talking to fans and how much it's actually watched. And now it's on YouTube and they can watch it that way all across the world. I mean, my 17 year old son watched every single episode about two years ago. He's a huge fan of the show. So that's a, another big memory for me of the show. And then, you know what, just seeing all the people before going in and out, you know, because it's a very small pool of people that were doing it. And you, you know, when you're doing it for a year or two, you, you know, Sometimes, you know, you're pushed back by a half an hour. So you're in a waiting room with someone. You see the same faces and stuff. So I have a lot of good memories in that regard with Metabots as well. Hmm. Do you, I guess, uh, keep up with anyone or uh, still have friendships? With anyone that you met in those sort of crossover periods, either Metabots or later on down the line? Many. I mean, uh, like I said, Rob Tinkler, I, I've talked to Rob even during the pandemic a few times. I mean, I, I live an hour outside of the main hub in, of Toronto, so I don't really go in as much and I do a lot of home studio stuff now. But uh, yeah, definitely Rob Tinkler. I think Julie Lemieux did a lot of voices on that show back in the day. I still still see Julie a lot. Really, probably the four or five multiple multi-voice actors I still see on a regular basis. Uh, with uh, Bakugan, uh, Ranger Rob, Wish Fart, Total Drama Rama, you do a whole yep. lot of, a wide range of shows. Uh, so do you see voice acting as sort of your, your side gig to stand-up comedy, or is it just sort of a fun hobby that you happen to get paid for? So when you talk about stand-up, at least in North America, you cannot generally make a living from just stand up unless you want to eat hot dogs every day and crash on people's couches. It's just, that's the way it is. So for me, I had to make a conscious decision about 15 or 20 years ago to figure out ways in show business to pay my rent to therefore be able to do stand up comedy. So I'm not saying I'm not appreciative of the cartoon world. What I'm saying is it will always come second to me to stand up comedy. Um, I'm just honest about that. But I love doing it because the stand-up world is very vicious. It's very negative. And in the cartoon world, it generally isn't. It's, you know, I've done something, I've done a three-line read where they treated me better than agents I've worked 10 years in with stand-up comedy. Like, I felt better about myself after a small three-line read at a cartoon than I have of 10 years of stand-up sometimes. I mean, it's just different worlds. But the thing that's great about the animated world is, is that, Generally, you're working with very talented people. No one got the job through nepotism. No one got the job through a friend. They're all pros. When you're in the room with some of these people, you're like, man, should I really have this job? Because they're that good. And it's, it's, it's refreshing because I can compare it to the stand-up world. Mm. So, and also, I guess, uh, how many beer glasses have you had thrown at you while recording lines for Metabots? So. None yet. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm hoping. <laughs> I think that video would go viral. That'd be a good one. Uh, um, but yeah, we've talked a bit about, I guess, your, your stand-up and your voice acting and stuff. They are very, very different worlds. Yes. Uh, how yes. do you keep those separate, I guess? So up until probably the last five years, nobody really... Well, it's not that nobody, but a lot of people didn't really go back and try to find pictures of people and find out about their careers. It was just their favorite voice and they didn't really go past that. But now obviously with the internet in the last five, even maybe even 10 years, the ability to track someone down and be able to see who they are and what they do is a bit of a problem for me. And I try to keep the two worlds separate because I'm a father of three kids. So when people come and see my stand up and I talk about my kids, they think I make it up. I don't have kids. I do have kids. What do my kids think of my stand-up? My kids have never seen my stand-up. Even my 17-year-old has barely seen anything of it. I try to keep it very separate. Even to my shows, I have a rule, no minors, 
There's a poster that says no refunds. You know what you're getting. No bones about it. I don't want to jack anyone or screw anyone or punk anyone. And I've been lucky that no one has kind of went, I'm a big Ranger Rob fan and I'm eight and I'm going to look up Darren Frost. It hasn't happened yet. When it happens, I'm going to have to cross that path. Uh, I don't know what I can do about it. I can't take stuff down because I don't know how familiar your fans are with the Wayback Machine, but I can take my website down, but stuff is out there forever. If you Google my name, it's still going to say Darren the Devil, stand-up, X-rated, dirty comic. And I think they're different. I think it's apples and oranges, but the people who pay your rent sometimes don't think that way. So I, I get it. Yeah, it seems... I guess there's always the, the separating the artist from the art, and I think it's two different arts. And it's... Yes. You know, people can enjoy both and uh, it doesn't necessarily taint or dirty the other. Uh, but as you say, that's not how other people uh, see the world. Yeah, I mean, we live in a world where some people have a lot of free time and they have an agenda and they want to cancel people. I'm not saying all can all people getting canceled. I'm just talking about specific situations where it's like uh, you might be going a little too far back or it wasn't as bad as you're portraying it. But, you know, you can't do anything about it. It's just there and hopefully... The people I've worked with know that I'm a good person. But when you know what? You go into a CD comedy club where alcohol is being served to a bunch of drunks and they want to hear dick jokes. They don't want to hear Ranger Rob. They don't want to hear cartoon voices. They're there to hear what they've Googled me about and that's what they're getting. Uh, so with all of your other voice roles, not necessarily just Metabots, do you have a, a favorite voice or a favorite role that you've had throughout the years? I think my favorite still is my first role I ever did. It was on a show called Timothy Goes to School uh, in North America. Um, and the reason was my, is my favorite is obviously it was my first. So a very great learning curve. But also, and you know, this isn't a very popular opinion, but I'm not a fan of cartoons that are just out to sell toys. And I think there's a lot of cartoons that mean well. And I think there's a lot of cartoons that are just made to sell toys. I've done them. I take the money. It's my rent. But Timothy Goes to School was aged for like three to five. They never made toys. They never tried to sell anything to anyone. It was just a feel-good show for little kids. And there is a little bit of innocence to that that obviously I don't get in my stand-up world or even my on-camera acting world because I've done a lot of movies and stuff. But there was just an innocence to all that, being my first one and being for little kids and not selling them toys. It was, it was a great thing. Outside of all that, probably Camp Lake Bottom was a big show for me because it ran five years. It was a great character for me, Squirt. And my third one would be a show called 16, which was a really big show in North America. I played a character that was only supposed to be in one episode originally. He was the Star Wars nerd. And they liked my voice so much, it turned into a five-year job. So... You know, I don't pat myself on the back very often, but I'm going to pat myself on the back for, you know, a good job there. I guess, uh, how does that process happen? Do they just call you back the next day? Or was it on the same day? Like, man, we really like that. We want to bring it back more. What happens is generally they're writing episodes for most cartoons, at least in North America, like five or six in advance. So if they hit something they really like, you know, the next couple episodes, yeah, you're not going to be in. But in three or four or five weeks, you're at, you could be back in again. So I also wonder if it really was, maybe they were toying at the idea from the very beginning of this character might be something. I don't want to take all the credit, like I'm a star. Oh man, they love me. I think they might've thought this might be a good add on. And then when it all came together, it worked. So that's generally how things like that work. Arcs of cartoons, some of them are very mapped out. Some of them, not so much. I mean, Japanimation, it's very hard because the show is already done and the arcs have to be really well planned because it's all just matching the flaps and the voices. But original cartoons uh, where the voice is done first, because that's also the difference between Japanimation and other cartoons. They're done, they're done first, the other ones. So they can have more play. Uh, ignoring the, the toy aspect, uh, yes. the difference between original cartoons uh, and Japanimation, do you have a preference of which to do style-wise? Original cartoons, because I can create more of a character. It is because, like I just said, they're generally starting something. You can mold something a little more. Um, 
I still do Japanimation. I did a, a role in Bakugan. I did a Kubo character, which was a lot of fun going back and doing it. Um, it's just, I think people just look at me at, at certain ways in animation in this city, and I just didn't get pulled back into that much Japanimation. I still love doing it. Um, it's just the characters are very well defined because mm -hmm. they have to be. So matching what I love to do with a voice that I'm great for and I can add a little bit of character is very hard in those kinds of shows. So if uh, somehow it all went wrong all those years ago, uh, sure. voice acting didn't kick off, uh, couldn't fund the, the stand-up stuff as much, mm -hmm. where do you think your life would have headed if it didn't take this path? Well, I can tell you that I, I probably would not still be in show business. I would like to think that I could bob and weave and find something else, but in the last, definitely, the, the thing about stand-up is it's a very much a young person's game. And that's not about so much the audience wants young comics, the machine wants young comics, because the energy it takes and the wherewithal to stay in the game, you know, this idea that you keep talking about quitting every six months, it doesn't really go away as you age. And you just have more time behind you going, am I going to keep doing this? So cartoons let me not have to take as many bad gigs. So if I didn't have cartoons, I would have done probably more bad gigs and probably said, you know what? I'm tapping out at 35 or 40, but now, you know, I'm 49 now. I've been a comic for almost 30 years. I've been doing cartoons for, I guess it's almost 15 or 20 years now. So um, it's a marriage that's kind of working right now. And especially in this pandemic, I'm still doing two shows a week or one, one show a week, every other week. So two shows, um, I, that's my income. My life is dead. There is no stand up. It's dead. There is no shows anymore, at least for the short term. So yeah, it's one of those jobs, I guess, that uh, voice acting that can just keep going, just continue um, as long as you've got the, the home studio. Which, And, you know, once, once you're past puberty, if you can do a voice at 21, you probably could do that voice even up to like 51, 61, whatever, because your voice isn't going to change that much. You may go a little bit deeper, but that's only on the high highs. My voice has always been about this level since I've been about 25. So, you know, if these shows run for 30 years, I can still do them. And I've worked with many people in this business that I go home and Google and I'm like, oh my God, that guy was on that show in the 70s and he was on that in the 80s and I didn't know that. Or she was in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the stop animation, which is my favorite kind of animation. I love stop animation. That's my favorite thing. I'm a big nostalgia guy for that kind of thing. And I actually did one uh, called Jojo Circus in North America. And it was just great to see because it was like, like, this is my favorite thing. And I worked with some people that did those 70s cartoons. So age is not a factor in cartoons as much as other things. It is when you're young. Now, I've worked on shows where the kid is like eight. And then by the time they're 11, they have to change the main character because their voice cr uh, changed or cracked. Mm. And so they need to keep that person young. Yeah, it, it seems like a bit of a trade-off. I guess that's why we see a lot of uh, female voice actresses doing the yes. young male protagonist because yes. it's consistent. Yes, and when you want a 12-year-old boy or you want an 8-year-old boy, you can hire an 8-year-old, and I really know that they do try. I've been there where they audition kids, but I've also been there where it didn't work out with an 8-year-old. And the thing about an animation world is simply this, and I talk about the people that work all the time and are great. Why would someone take a risk on something when they know they can hire an 8-year-old role to a 35 year old woman that's been doing it for 15 years and can knock it out of the park every single time. Mm. It's very, very hard for them to risk it if they can't find an exact voice that can work for a good amount of time. It's a hard risk. Yeah. Uh, so looking at all the sort of animation that's out there, do you have any sort of show you've watched and you've gone, man, I really would like to voice a character on that show or this specific character or, or anything like that? Yeah, so for me, uh, of, all, of all time, I'm a retro cartoon guy. But currently, if I could have done a role on Phineas and Ferb, I would, have, I would have just said, okay, I'm done. Because even though it's for kids, that show was so amazingly written and well done. I was lucky that I also did two other shows in the total drama world because those scripts are written by stand-up comics predominantly, a lot of them 
or at least people who had backgrounds in stand-up, and there's a lot of good jokes. And especially Total Drama World or um, Island, a lot older jokes, like jokes for older. I wish I could have done more voices on that. Uh, I mean, there's also the adult cartoons. I would love to have done Bob's Burgers or other adult shows, but they aren't predominantly done in Canada. Those are mostly done in America. I live in Canada. I'm okay with that. You know, um, every kid that meets me, they find out I do the, the voice of their favorite. They don't care, but the parents are impressed. That's always the thing it is. The dad's like, oh my God, you're that. And the kid's like, yeah, big deal. So what? They run off. Uh, I guess... Uh recognizing you in public and stuff like that would probably predominantly be from live action stuff. Um, yes. Does anybody ever, I guess, overhear your voice or uh, have you ever been recognized from those voice roles without prompting it? Yes. So some people will hear me talking and then they'll be like, did you ever do cartoon work? And I'm like, yes. And I go off and I'm like, Oh my God, that voice. Oh yes, of course. That voice. I got that a fair bit with Camp Lake Bottom um, and a few other kind of more recent shows. But uh, yeah, I, I'm predominantly 15 years ago, I did a lot of commercials, like a lot in North America. So I used to get recognized all the time because, you know, back then commercials, cable wasn't the same way it was. They had a huge impact. So I was on the TV screen so much that I literally sometimes couldn't even go out to like big functions like a beer festival or a concert because I would con constantly be talked to, which is fine to a certain point, but at some point point you're like enough you know does that died i guess have you been doing as many commercials or has that died no. down no so that's the that's the killer with the stand-up mm. on camera it's your face attached to a voice that they they google you it's kind of like no i'm listerine and we don't want that associated with our brand that's products that's not a tv show it's a big difference and they have teams of people, you know, checking for that. And I, I have a degree in marketing. I used to be on that side. I understand it. The only thing I miss about commercial work is the money. Not going to lie. The money's great. There's not a lot of art in a Dentine commercial. I'm sorry. You know, like this, the number of times I was on set in a commercial and they think that they're doing like Citizen Kane and, you know, they're not even doing Citizen Gum. You know, it's like, this is just lame, but it's serious for them. It's their livelihood. I get it. But, I couldn't take it that serious. Yeah, just go in, hit your lines, and uh, yeah. head out. Yeah. Wow, this chicken's amazing. You know, like that's, that's just not me anymore. Uh, I think uh, with Metabots nowadays, um, it's got this uh, nostalgia hit with it because mm -hmm. it is so old. Uh, and you mentioned being a, a lover of the classics. Um, do you think that we're in this sort of... Um, generation where everything's coming back and you're going to be those older roles are going to start being more recognized and people are going to start watching the older stuff more than uh i want to say mass produced but the stuff that's yeah. getting pumped out now i i think that through word of mouth and obviously things like this and the internet it's helping shows have a longer life i mean i was just talking to my son an hour ago when he's like why did metabots end it's his favorite he thinks it's way better than some of the other Bakugans or any of that. He preferred Metabots. And I said, you know what? I don't know. I'm not inside the business meeting. I said, all I can assume is that, you know, they ended the number of episodes in Japan. So if there's no new ones from Japan coming, they're not going to redo it or create it just for North American market unless it's a massive, massive show. And I just don't know if it got the numbers. I would love for a show like that to come back or to continue uh, most of the cast is still around. They can easily pull it off. But, you know, I used to love Star Blazers. That was my big thing when I was a kid uh, for anime and, and some of the other shows like that, and Voltron and G-Force. And I was a big fan of it. And I know that they're redoing those shows, and they have uh, on Netflix and around the world. So you never know. Uh, I guess if people want to get in touch or see some of your work, uh, you have mm -hmm. social media links and stuff like that. I do. Uh, so that you're I, uh, willing to share. <laughs> that I'm willing to share. Uh, if you just type my name into Google, and if you're old enough to figure out how to get somewhere, you're old enough to look at it. We'll just leave it at that. That seems fair. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thanks a lot for coming on and uh, chatting about the old classic Metabots. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.